consumer watch, Apple and the maker of Fortnite, Epic Games, will battle it out in court today in a lawsuit that could change how millions of iPhone users download apps. The developer claims Apple is monopolizing mobile gaming through its App Store, gatekeeping how developers reach iPhone users, and collecting a 30% commission on all in-app purchases. So last year, Apple banned Epic Games from its App Store for finding a loophole to avoid the fees. So with more on this, let's bring in CBS News technology reporter Dan Patterson. Dan, I think this is such a fascinating story because, I mean, it's Epic Games and this is going to be sort of an epic legal battle. Epic Games is probably one of the few um, game creators that's big enough to take on Apple. So can you just lay out how we got here? How did the two companies get to where they are now battling it out in court? Yeah, that's right, Anne Marie. This is not uh, a uh, David versus Goliath battle. Instead, it's two Goliaths. So the conflict kicked off last summer when Epic Games, who create Fortnite, uh, one of the most popular games in the iOS store, uh, and made almost a billion dollars in revenue over two years, they launched a payment mechanism that bypasses the 30% fee that Apple charges for software sold in their iOS app store. Apple responded by booting Fortnite out of the app store, and then Epic countered by in instantly filing suit uh, against Apple, claiming that uh, Apple's removal of Fortnite is yet another example of, quote, Apple flexing its enormous power to maintain a monopoly. Dan, it feels like every time we do one of these stories, uh, it's the creators of Fortnite, Epic Games, that's sort of in the middle of it. Uh, they've been called out for, for example, stealing people's dance moves. Did you know this, Emery? Like they steal, like you can, you know, create yeah. a character that does his dance and they've been sued, but they sort of always seem to weather those attacks. So um, what can we expect from this testimony? Uh, so we can expect uh, testimony from uh kind of pun intended, a, an epic parade of executives, <laughs> including uh, CEO uh -huh. Tim Sweeney um, and Apple CEO Tim Cook, uh, forensic expert Neil Barnes and uh, Lauren Hitt from the Wharton Business School. Uh, what's so fascinating about this, Vlad, is, yeah, you kind of alluded to some of Epic's business practices there, but it's that they have deliberately taken on Apple. This Nobody stumbled into this. They provoked this fight, and they're hoping to set a legal precedent with it uh, that would potentially open up the iOS app store for all kinds of competitors. So this has been something that game creators have been complaining about for quite some time now. Why has it taken so long for anyone to challenge Apple on how its app store is structured for app developers? Yeah, this is Apple's first real legal challenge since Xerox uh, sued the company for uh, stealing its intellectual property in the late 80s. And what you said a moment ago, Anne-Marie, is kind of what Epic and um, it, the Coalition for App Fairness, this is a nonpartisan or, or, or uh, nonprofit organization that App uh, Epic helped create and features almost 50 independent developers who all kind of say different versions of the same thing. I've spoken with Spotify, uh, with Proton Mail, which makes a secure email service, uh, and with Basecamp, uh, among other companies. And they all say that Apple uses uh, the iOS App Store uh, in a way that is monopolistic because uh, this is kind of a market unto itself um, that. Apple's control uh, over the iPhone plus iOS plus the App Store makes it a unique market. And they leverage this market mm. to kind of dictate terms to developers. Now, Apple counters that by saying, hey, look, first of all, the 30% surcharge is industry standard, and they point to Nintendo, PlayStation, Xbox, and a slew of other uh, stores that also control and lock down both the hardware as well as the software and charge 30%. So Apple says that, hey, look, what we're doing is industry standard, and if you want to play Fortnite, you can play Fortnite on a bunch of other platforms. You don't have to play it on mm -hmm. our platform. Uh, so it, it's really, it's, it's fascinating because both of these arguments are, are pretty compelling. 
So if I, I should say that's that's one of the things that put Fortnite in a really unique position here, in that they're not just a 100% you know app platform that you can go you know to the to the website or wherever you can go somewhere else and play. But for a lot of these other developers, all they are are app developers. The only option to have access to you know their customer base is to go through Apple, and so they kind of have not been able to do what um, what Epic has been able to do. Sorry, Vlad. It's okay. So, uh, Dan, if a judge rules in favor of Epic, uh, you know, this could obviously, you mentioned this, um, change the iOS landscape for millions of Apple users who download apps because of what Emory was just talking about. Um, so what would that look like for those of us who love to play video games and who love uh, those Epic games and those who develop those games? Yeah, so I'm one of those people. I play video games. I don't play Fortnite, but I play all sorts of other games, both on iOS and Android. Uh, and I can see both sides of this argument. Um, what this could do is, look, if you use Android, you know that buried within layers of warnings and other uh, security notifications um, is the ability to kind of customize Android to however you want. Um, you can install third-party stores on a lot of Android devices. So what this could potentially do is open up iOS uh, and force Apple to allow competitive developers to, to put other stores on it. Um, much like how on your Mac you can download and install stay Steam, which sells video games, as well as Epic's own video game shop, and a number of other platforms. Uh, it could potentially disintermediate Apple's ability to collect revenue from app developers directly and allow them to make their own customer relationships. Uh, so it could potentially really shift how we use the iPhone and iOS software. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Apple is, or, or Epic is not a small company, and Apple says that, hey, even if we lose, we're going to appeal and we'll win on appeal. All right, we will be Just watching. Just a quick question before we let you go, Vlad. Could, I mean, sorry, um, Dan. Could this potentially have a ripple effect um, for other companies too, like, you know, the Google Play Store, I, everyone knows I'm like a big VR person, so I'm all about Oculus, um, or, or is this really unique to Apple's setup? Well, Apple says yes, uh, and I talked to them on Friday, and they said, hey, look, this could set a precedent that um, allows courts to dictate how software functions, which is fairly unique. They, at least Apple, differentiates this from, uh, say, when Microsoft uh, went to court in the late 90s about the way uh, the Internet Explorer web browser was baked into the platform. Apple says that uh, if the court does this, the court will be telling developers uh, like Apple how software is written and the experience users have. They also say this will break the security experience and open up other um, uh, users of iOS to security challenges and, and uh, hacking. So yeah, it could set a precedent, uh, at least according to Apple. That could be what Epic wants. You know, I, I, Amory is always talking about this uh, Oculus thing, and Dan, you know, I, you, like you, I play a lot of console games, and I have my entire life. But the, you know, I, I just I I feel like I have a very like tenuous grip with reality as it is today. I don't know that I could get into this Oculus thing, but she's always. I mean, there's definitely moments when Amory is talking about it. And I'm like, should I dip my toe in this like virtual reality thing? I don't know. I don't know. Well, well, that is a whole other topic, know, I think. Um, mm. Go ahead, Dan. There is something analogous with the way Facebook, uh, who owns Oculus, control the App Store. Uh, Facebook also yes. locks that down, and, and they do take a percentage of uh, the transactions that happen in that store. So that's so that's the analogy, right? That yeah. there is that similar that similar. The, yeah, there is. Uh, I, I, it has come to mind, Dan, that I thought in the future we may actually be talking about that because it makes people very uncomfortable when, and this is a whole other topic, but when Facebook bought Oculus um, and they slowly started to sort of take over, they required you to have a Facebook account now mm. in order to play on Oculus. And people feel very uncomfortable about that. They have all their personal information um, on Facebook and would prefer that their virtual world be whatever they want to make it, you know, be complete 
completely separate. And uh, yeah, Dan, maybe we can talk about that. Yeah, let's um, talk at about another that. Time That's really when we interesting. Have these huge, these huge um, platforms that you know that what they part of what they do is you know if they can't develop a co competition, they gobble up the competition, and so you have a lot of your information in the hands of very few platforms. Um, and you know, what does that mean? And I guess that's kind of part of an ongoing conversation that we have been having with Dan uh, when it comes to privacy concerns and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But I digress. Fascinating, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, Dan, always great to talk to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Good to see you.